This is episode number 367 with astrophysicist and online data science instructor, Sam Hinton. Welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. My name is Kirill Eremenko, data science coach and lifestyle entrepreneur. And each week we bring you inspiring people and ideas to help you build your successful career in data science. Thanks for being here today. And now let's make the complex simple. Welcome back to the Super Day Science Podcast, everybody. Super pumped to have you back here on the show. And uh, today we're hosting Sam Hinton, who's returning for the second time round. The first time he was on this podcast was in episode number 303 uh, in October 2019, where we talked about hypothesis testing and what it means for the world of data science, along with other topics. That episode was hilarious, and I highly recommend checking it out. That's SDS 303. And this one is going to be super fun as well. Sam is just always fun to talk to. He's got a great personality and very outgoing and loves to share things. So I, I had a lot of laughs and I'm sure you're going to have a lot of laughs along the way with us. So what is happening in Sam's life? What did we talk about? Number one, very important. I think you're going to be very interested in this is that Sam is the lead data analyst for the COVID Critical Care Consortium. Uh, which is one of the largest studies in the world right now looking into uh, COVID and COVID-19 and what is happening to people uh, who end up in critical care, things like ventilation and other factors. So you will get a lot of interesting thoughts on a da- from a data scientist who's actually working on the, like spearheading this direction, working with uh, other uh, scientists in over 100 or approximately 100 different countries around the world, and you'll find out what uh, what they're looking into. In addition, uh, Sam will talk about some of the challenges of data, like what are the real world challenges that data scientists face? Like right now, he's facing all of this data that's coming in that is inaccurate or maybe incomplete in many cases, um, has, uh, thing, has to be cleaned up, has to be uh, normalized, ha- lots of pre-work on the data has to happen and you'll find out how he's building this data pipeline and what it means. We'll be talking quite a bit about data pipelines. So very, very interesting. uh, And I'm sure everybody can get a lot of value out of this. We'll also talk about data modeling, Bayesian statistics, data science go virtual and how Sam will be joining us to run a workshop there. So make sure to listen in on that. That's going to be very cool. And maybe uh, that workshop will be right for you. And uh, at the end, we'll talk about astrophysics. You'll find out some cool things about dark energy and dark matter. Super exciting, super fun podcast. Can't wait for you to check it out. So without further ado, let's dive straight into it. And I bring to you Sam Hinton, astrophysicist and online data science instructor. Welcome back to the Super Day Science Podcast, everybody. Super pumped to have you back here on the show. Today, we've got a very special guest, uh, Mr. Sam Hinton. Sam, welcome back. How are you going? Oh, thanks for having me again. It's always a pleasure. Fantastic, man. Two, second time. How long was it last time? Last time was like, oh, what is it? Eight months ago or so we chatted? Oh, I have no idea. More than a week, which means I barely <laughs> remember it. Oh, how have you been since then? Things going well? Oh, things have been hectic. I, I'm sure that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people where they've lost their jobs and things aren't hectic. And a lot of other people in recent days who now have 10 times the workload and don't know when to sleep. I guess I'm lucky to be one of the second group. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's good. Why do you not know when to sleep? What's happening in your world? Well, I've got my my normal job. So I, I'm a postdoc at the University of Queensland, and I'm trying to lead the Dark Energy Survey Supernova Cosmology Analysis. So lots of fun astrophysics science that I'm supposed to be doing. And I am now also the lead data analyst for the COVID Critical Care Consortium, which is, as of writing right now, I think the, the largest international study on COVID-19 in the world, uh, specifically looking at things like ventilation and you know, all the stuff that we know is uh, quite difficult with COVID. 
Wow, that's really cool. Like, uh, how many? Uh, first of all, like, w- what countries are in in that co- consortium? Oh, we've got uh, almost fifty countries now. Uh, I know mm. the the US uh, signed on weeks ago, but now that all the legal agreements are in place, their hospitals are coming online. Uh, we've got data from Estonia, from Kuwait, uh, from almost well a whole ton of European countries, apart from France. France has their own study and. They're not joining ours. We don't have any from Russia either. But mm. almost every other country is signing up. So we've hit almost 50 countries, hundreds upon hundreds of different hospital sites. And uh, soon the data should start pouring in, we hope. Okay. Uh, but tell me, like, how, how did you get this job? Like, out of all data scientists in Australia or in the world, I don't know even, how did you get this? Uh, mostly luck. A lot of things in life are luck or just being in the right place at the right time. And uh, it turns out that in this giant collaboration, uh, there's the data is hosted at Oxford. So Oxford and the parent company overseeing their study, uh, sort of like the, the big players. And the University of Queensland has an agreement with Oxford. And so people were looking around at UQ for someone who could do it. And they had all these issues with the data um, and they needed essentially someone that could help out on the machine learning side of things, on the visualization side of things, on the data pipeline side of things. And people just going around saying, who has experience? Someone talked to, well, one of the project, uh, the, the head machine learning investigator talked to my supervisor, my supervisor, my postdoc supervisor said, oh, well, why don't you talk to Sam? He's got previous experience in all these areas. She talked to me and then an hour later, she said, okay, I want you to lead this. And I said, oh boy, um, (laughs) this is a lot. (laughs) Are you sure? And she said, yes. And that's been my my life for the past couple of months. Yeah, that's really cool. So, um, but how does this all work? Like how big is this whole team? Are you the only lead data scientist? Are there other lead data scientists? Like are there data scientists in different countries? Are you responsible for Australia? How does this all work? Yeah, it's a bit of a complicated, I'm not going to say mess, but it's, it's, a, it's a very spaghetti-like situation here simply because we're dealing with medical data. And mm. as soon as you deal with medical data, there's a whole bunch of confidentiality and privacy agreements, things that you have to take into account. Uh, but because I was essentially the first person that got access to the data, uh, they've now come down and said, look, we don't want anyone else accessing the data. And I'm one of the very few people in the world now that can get the raw data. And one of my jobs is to take this raw data, run it through a data cleaning, standardization, and de-identification pipeline that I built, and then distribute those data products to specifically UQ researchers. So we are getting other universities in. So we have, for example, in Brisbane, researchers from QUT, um, but they get added to sort of UQ system and then they can access the data. On top of that, uh, we have companies that have reached out and said, hey, we want to help with uh, the machine learning. We want to help with this or that. We've had Amazon and IBM and we're working with both of them right now and, and Fast AI, a whole bunch of companies. But the big issue is that, uh, you know, it's sensitive data. So it's not something like that you can just upload onto Kaggle and have an open source Kaggle competition. <laughs> yeah. You can't do that. Uh, so there's a lot of people that have offered to help and they're simply unable to because we haven't got data sharing agreements with them. We would be in very hot water if we gave them the data. So there are, uh, you know, Can't you science- de-identify the data? Yes, uh, but the issue is even if it's been de-identified, what you normally have is then a security team comes in, takes your de-identified data, and they want to see if they can break it, if they can re-identify patients. And the issue is that step takes a little while to do. And we've had some preliminary groups at UQ say that, okay, these are the variables that are quasi-identifiers, and if you combine it with social media data, we may be able to re-identify a person doing this and that. But until everything's like proven a hundred percent or you know good enough, it's hard to even share de-identified data. But we're yeah. moving towards that section. But obviously, as soon as these things come in, and as soon as there are legal agreements and everything in the way, it's no longer just like a, a one or two day task. Yeah. There's back and forth between legal teams, and things you, slow down. Have you heard of the Netflix prize on Kaggle? There's a Netflix prize. There no, was like years ago. <laughs> oh. Years ago. When Netflix was just, I think it was like 2000, oh my God, I don't even remember, like 
uh, I, I'm going to, I don't remember that many years ago, basically, Netflix went on Kaggle, they posted like their data, de-identified data for people to have this competition. The prize was a million dollars to build a recommender system, or the prize pool was a million dollars to build a recommender system that uh, predicts the best way possible, you know, what movie you want to watch next, what show. And, you know, it was successful. They were going to launch it, uh, I think in 2015, they were going to launch a Netflix prize number two. But then somebody wrote a research paper in the U.S. saying, showing that he could identify the people from Netflix prize data by, you know, combining parameters in certain ways. And then uh, those, like a lot of people, I, th I think, wanted or either did launch a class action lawsuit against Netflix right. <laughs> for that. How crazy is that? So, yeah. Yeah. It's definitely risky. a place you don't want to take the risk. Yeah. Hope you're enjoying this amazing episode. I've got a cool announcement for you and we'll get straight back to it. Virtual Data Science Conference. Here is, well, you've probably heard of Data Science Go, the conference that we've been running for the past three years in Southern California. And maybe you've attended, if so, it was super cool to have you there, but maybe you weren't able to attend for the reason of being in a completely different country or the flights were too long or the timing wasn't perfect. There could be plenty of reasons why you weren't able to attend. But now we're bringing Data Science Go to you. So this June, we're hosting Data Science Go virtually and you can attend and get an amazing experience there. And guess what? The best part is that it's absolutely free. Just head on over to datasciencego.com and get your tickets today. This will be our very first time running a virtual event, but nevertheless, we're still going to combine the three key pillars of fun, amazing talks and networking into this event. You'll hear from speakers like John Crone, Sam Hinton, Adlan de Ponteves, Stephen Welch, and many others. Plus, you'll be able to network with your peers. This event is going to be epic on all fronts and we'd love to see you there. Head on over to datasciencego.com slash virtual and get your ticket today. The number of seats is limited. We'd love to have everybody there, but for our very first event, we're limiting the number of seats to make it more manageable. So make sure to get your tickets today if you want to be part of this. And on that note, I look forward to seeing you there. And now let's get back to this amazing episode. Yeah, okay, all right. So you get all this data, you... Uh, what is this data science pipeline? Tell us about it. Like, I, of course, by the way, for everybody listening, this is none of this is medical advice. We're going to, as much as possible, avoid. Uh, well, we are going to avoid sharing sensitive information that Sam cannot share on this podcast. But most importantly, none of this is medical advice. Uh, if you hear anything related to coronavirus, it's opinions only. So, with that caveat, what's what's this data science pipeline like? Uh, what goes into this process of building one, and why do you need one in this specific case? Right. So there are a few things to keep in account when we're talking about this specific study. The first is that the, the database and the system where the data is gathered was written by a very smart and very talented uh, re UQ researcher. Uh, I won't give you the name because I'm sure he respect, you know, I want to respect his privacy um, and people end up emailing everyone over everything. Uh, but he, he just sorry, just to add, UQ is University of Queensland in Australia, a bit, one of the yes. uh, top universities in Australia. Yes. Good clarification. I tend not to define my acronyms. That's a <laughs> trait that comes from my astrophysics roots. Uh, so he's made this this great database, and it's used for a whole bunch of different medical studies, including the one that I'm working with, which is the COVID Critical Care Consortium. And it was originally named ECMO Card. If anyone, if that rings a bell to anyone listening. Uh, but what it means is it was a very generic way and the doctors go and they get CRFs. So essentially they print out a sh whole bunch of sheets of paper where they write down the details and then someone goes through and uploads it into this database. The issue is that there's very little checks done on the database. It was written to be general by a person, you know, by himself, essentially, uh, and a long time ago too. So it's not exactly, you know, it wasn't written this year with all the modern frameworks. It's a fairly old system. And that means that when the data comes back, we have very little guarantee on what the data should look like. Dates don't have to be dates. Numeric values can come through filled with strings or letters. Uh, that's that's the, the easy part to identify because at least we know things should be numbers. And if it comes through, we have, for example, 107. But the O in 107 is the degree symbol from degree centigrade. 
And there's a lot mm. of weird issues like that simply because we're mixing European keyboards and non-European keyboards. But then even when you get that down, uh, there are things that haven't been validated, like we want to take patient records every day so that we can track their evolution. But sometimes we have two or three records for the same day. And it's like, well, I've entered the date wrong, but there's no validation on that. And then even if you do all of that, you now have hundreds of hospitals from dozens of countries, and they use different units for everything. And so you get a whole range of numbers come in, and for a lot of the cases, you know what the units are. Then you just do basic unit conversion. Some of the fields don't have units as import. So you have to try and infer from the ranges what the unit should be. Mm. That's tricky to do because in medical data, things like lymphocyte counts can span four orders of magnitude in a living patient. So how are you supposed to deal with that? And then on top of all of that, because the data is filled in from, you know, someone writing down off a piece of paper, it's highly incomplete. Around 80% of, if if you just turn this into a 2D data frame, around 80% is missing. Mm. And that's a huge problem for imputation, especially because in this current, like right now when I'm talking, we don't have that many records. We have hundreds of patients and less than 100 if we count just those where we know whether they were survived and discharged alive or whether they didn't survive and succumb to coronavirus. And with such little data, how are you supposed to do effective imputation? So we have to have multiple strategies that we then need to try and vet. And all of that needs to happen every day. So we download the data, clean the data, standardize it, and try out a bunch of things every single day so that we can go back to the ICUs, back to the hospitals when we need, and say, hey, I think you've put this in wrong here, or maybe this is a really cool, really interesting novel result. And so all of this needs to happen in a very quick, very automated fashion to make sure that we can get the results back as quickly as possible. Wow. And I could just imagine the the doctors is like a battlefield for them. They're running around trying to save people's lives. The last thing they care about or the last thing that's on their mind is to sit down and properly, carefully input all the data for Mr. Sam Hinton in Australia. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's, it's a difficult sell, isn't it? Because especially writing things down on a piece of paper that someone then has to copy in, it's just not an efficient way of doing it. So it's one of the things that Amazon reached out and we said, hey, you're well suited to this, uh, you know, gathering data and using it. Uh, but obviously there's a whole bunch of privacy concerns when you decide to bring in a large corporation. So there's all the, the legal issues there where we have to be very careful about whether or not they can actually have the data at the end. And the answer is no, right? They will help us gather the data and then the idea is they don't get access to it. Mm-hmm. But then it's, okay, well, do we develop an app? Do we try and set up Alexa so that the doctors can simply read out the values into their phone and it will populate the form for them using you know natural language processing? So there's a whole bunch of concerns there. But even then, the doctors don't have time to go through and even just read out what the values are. So countries like Germany, those that haven't been massively afflicted yet, as in those that haven't broken through their capacity in the hospital system, are doing things like getting student doctors and med students to go out to the hospitals. And they just drive from hospital to hospital. They take the paper and they enter it into the databases. They go around and pick out the values and record them and enter it in. Because there's simply, in many countries, absolutely no chance that we're going to get the people that are on the front lines trying to keep people alive to take a little break from that to do some data entry. It just mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so once uh, you have all this data uh, processed and cleaned, like, so what you're saying is you have to do this every day and there's no way for you to automate it completely that all these checks happen automatically. Yeah, so at the moment, every day we regenerate our data products. and Every day we regenerate a new list of issues that we then go back to the clinicians with and say, hey, by the way, uh, this value from this day looks a bit funky. Can you please double check that or is that a legit value? Um, And obviously that gets sent back, not every day. We don't want to overwhelm the sites, but the more egregious errors, the things that we can't fix ourselves, get sent back. Uh, And essentially the only time we do send them back is when we're losing data. So there are some uh, fields that we simply need. For example, when was the patient admitted to ICU? We want to track their evolution over their stay in the ICU, which means if we don't have when they were admitted, we don't know at what point they they fall in the timeline and we can't use their data. So it seems a shame, like all we need is this one variable for you to fill out 
And then we can use the 400 other variables that you put in for this patient. Mm -hmm. So we go back to them. And then the other thing that they want is every day, they don't just want issues. Right? Mm -hmm. No one wants just you know bad news every day. So we generate daily reports for them. And this simply comes down to some Jupyter notebooks, essentially, that are automatically generated and converted to HTML documents. And they all have interactive plots where we can show them basic statistics and demographics of their patients. So we know that COVID-19 affects, uh, oh, affects more men than women, and mm -hmm. it affects older people worse than they affect younger people. Mm -hmm. And so we want to keep up to date the statistics that they have saying, okay, what are the risk factors? Is arterial hypertension, like high blood pressure, a large risk factor or not? How about smoking? How about obesity, diabetes? All of these different things. And then obviously treatment, mm -hmm. one of the big questions, which are what is the difference in outcome when you look at different treatments? So who are on antibiotics? Who are on antivirals? Which antivirals are they on? And which antivirals have different ratios of success versus failure? So all of that is data that we try and generate every day into an HTML document that we can then send back to the clinicians. Interesting. Uh, you said you don't have that many, like you only have hundreds of patient records that are complete and you know like the full story. Wouldn't those insights be statistically not significant like if you're inferring that? Yeah, it's, it's a big problem, which is that in some cases... We have the numbers. So if, you, if you're not looking at the outcome, if you just want to say, hey, uh, what, like, what are the demographics of people that are being admitted? Mm -hmm. So you don't know the outcome. We can say some things there, but then we can't say a lot. And this is one of the reasons why we have to be very careful about what we give to clinicians and medical doctors, because we don't want to mislead anyone. Mm -hmm. right? We don't want to cause any unnecessary harm. So we have, for example, some clear trends in some, let's say, pH, so your blood pH levels, for broken down into those that survived and those that didn't. And at the moment, the trends look very different. But we can't give that to the clinicians because if you look under the hood at the number of patients that are being used to generate those trends, it's a tiny, tiny number. So if we give that away, we aren't confident that we've accounted for the difference in country and ethnicity and all these factors that differ across the patients because we don't have a representative sample. So it's something that we always have to keep in mind. And there are currently a whole bunch of data products and things that we are simply hiding so that we, I mean, we can see them when we're developing products like the dashboard, like the daily report, but we can't make them public because the mm -hmm. chance that they would mislead people is simply too high because without the, you know, the knowledge of statistics that would help inform the validity and the confidence of those trends, it's very easy to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, man. I'm so glad that you're doing this <laughs> out of all the people in the world, because I remember in our first podcast, you stressed <clears throat> very strongly that like even the 95% rule for uh, frequency statistic, you know, the p-value of uh, 0 0.05 is is not sufficient. That means like one, this was your quote, one, out, and I've used it many times, one out of 20 research papers out there is wrong. Every every 20th research paper is incorrect simply because we we agree that 5% confidence is, is sufficient. So like I, I can just imagine how rigorous you are about being, not misleading people and like misleading doctors here would cost people's lives. So you, you have to be very careful. About yeah, this. and it's so easy to happen because we have, uh, I think all up, we have around 450 variables. Mm. So imagine if one of 20 of them are wrong and we've drawn conclusions, that's almost 20 different hypotheses that we could incorrectly give if we just decided, hey, p-value 0.05, good enough, ship it out. And you'll notice <laughs> that if if you look through all the papers that are currently being published on COVID-19, especially some of the early ones, they're done on a cohort studies of three, four or five people. Five people. And it, yeah, so that there was a study in The Lancet with a, a patient, patient count of five. And it's like, okay, well, it's good. You know, you've got to get these things out. You know, there, there's, no, there's no time to sort of dilly-daddle on it. But at the same point, you're like, can we trust it? We, you don't know. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, um, and what happens next? So you, you do these reports back and forth. How's the workflow? Like, do, do you guys, like, uh, have meetings? Do you... I don't know, do you have like a vision? Is there some leadership? Uh, I have had around six hours of meetings today. 
Uh, so yes, there are meetings. There are meetings between the different companies that are trying to help out. There are weekly meetings with the PIs and myself to try and determine directions. What's a PI? Uh, the project investigator. Oh, so okay. one of the people leading the project. Uh, there are meetings every Thursday with the clinicians. There are meetings every Friday with the UQ researchers who are trying to apply models onto it. So in terms of where to go in the future, hopefully less meetings. <laughs> I can't see that actually happening. There will always be too many meetings. Uh, but what we want to do is once we get more data, once we can actually be a little bit more confident in the results that we're getting, hopefully we can do some interesting things with it. So at the moment, we've been doing things like generalized linear models and Cox regression and a bunch of other little statistical tests uh, to try and answer some of the queries that the clinicians have. But the other thing we want to do is use unsupervised learning to see if we can cluster the patients because uh, one of the current questions with COVID-19 are, are there separate phenotypes? So are there multiple variants of the virus going around and do they present differently? Like There's mutations. Been, yeah, essentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's been some, some marginal evidence so far published in papers that, yeah, it looks like there might be multiple phenotypes. And so we want to see, you know, can we cluster our results? Do our results indicate that there might be subgroups but again, hard to do with, you know, only a few hundred records. And then we also want to figure out things like causal modeling. So this is obviously a, a big issue, especially in the medical field, which is, let's say you notice a trend in some sort of variable. You don't know, is that trend because of COVID? Is that trend because of the medication? Is that trend because of any one of 400 billion different things? You're not quite sure. So you want to see if you can construct causal nets to determine, you know, exactly how the conditional probabilities in your model lie to see what is actually driving these trends. And of course, you know, it's, it's extremely complicated, especially in medicine, where each patient gets treated individually. They get treated based on how they're presenting. So it's not like you have a control group that just gets run through with the, the same treatments in the same way. If someone presents differently, they get treated differently. And it's so hard to standardize the results. So how, how are you going to do that? That's a very important question, not just in this application, but in, in other areas of life, whether it's uh, business or marketing or uh, product supply chains, like there's always, or weather even, you know, there's always going to be uh, these external factors. And as we know, correlation doesn't imply causation. So do you have any tricks you can share that you, you think might work? Well, the trick that we're trying to rely on <laughs> right now is one that isn't applicable to anyone else, uh, which is we're going back to the clinicians. Right? <laughs> there are obviously hundreds of years of, of medical advice and medical studies out there that we can try and make use of to say in other different, so if you don't take COVID, if you take flu or SARS, uh, like viruses, how do they normally present? What are the known causal models, known causal features more so in those different uh, pathogens or viruses. On top of that, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of a good way to explain it. So hmm, it, it is, it mostly just comes down to being a very thorny issue that we haven't fully solved. There is no ideal solution. Obviously you can use clinicians to help inform that, uh, but you can also just, you know, use a bunch of different models. So one of the things is we want consistency in our model outputs across models. So you don't just want to run some stupid random forest, get a result and just ship it out. You want a whole bunch of different models to agree so that you have confidence in it. And then you want to use explainability and interpretability techniques so that for every model that you've done, you can actually identify why that model is saying the things that it does. So this is something like you know, Shapley values, or just looking at the, the weights of each decision tree in a decision tree, so what are contributing to the final answers, so that you can try and hopefully get a consistent idea of the, the causal effects in all of your models, and you hope that they agree. <laughs> so well, for that purpose, do you think a neural network could work? Well, it could. It could. Uh, and we will have neural networks, uh, especially with the uh, patient evolution, so our time series data that well suits a recurrent neural network, something like a long short-term memory yeah. uh, network. But the, the main issue is we can't train any of those at the moment because we only have a few hundred data points. Yeah. But Especially I mean, if you want to do like... Sorry. Like, 
I, I was, was going to say, say yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say for for an LSTM network, so a deep network, you need a lot of data points, and it's very difficult in our case to uh, create new data. So data augmentation techniques are very difficult to do on data that is mostly incomplete. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for us to do something like a nearest neighbor imputation because uh, the dimension only of our models is in the hundreds and we only have hundreds of data points, right? Your nearest neighbor may be a very great distance in hyperspace from you. And, uh, you know, it makes it difficult because you need to imputate and then you need to try and augment your data without biasing your models. And okay. how to do that with only a few hundred samples for a novel disease, that's tough. 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 Um, but in terms of, for neural networks, in terms of interpretability, like even if you get a neural network that predicts everything well, uh, you know, assuming you solve somehow the problem of a low, a small data set, um, you can't really, it's really hard to interpret, you know, why exactly what what's what are the why are these neurons behaving in certain ways? So wouldn't that be a roadblock to using neural networks for this problem? Ah uh, yes, no, for, for sure. Uh, that's why we're trying to get uh, as much expertise as possible to come in. People that have done the similar things before. So I know you've seen things like with convolutional neural networks. There are ways of breaking down the features so that you can try and visualize them. And essentially, we want we need techniques like that that apply in general. And it's very hard to do with a neural network, especially as the depth starts to increase. So even if you try and visualize what neurons are lighting up, like how do you put that into something that a human can understand, right? It's, it's just a massively complicated linear algebra function, which we have essentially no intuition over. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's difficult. Um, and whilst some potential partial solutions exist for some specific variants of uh, neural networks like CNNs, I'm not sure, I, I don't know of a, a generalized solution. If someone out there listening to this knows a generalized solution to neural network in interpretability and explainability, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. okay, gotcha, for sure. And if anybody like listening has any ideas, I think at this stage, that will be very useful. Uh, so we'll share Sam's contact <laughs> details in the show notes as if he's not getting enough Meetings already. Oh uh, yeah, you should have seen. I did a uh, an interview with ABC Radio National last week, and it went live uh, two days ago. Mm. And I have been like flooded by well-meaning people offering support. I had one lady uh, come in and say, "Look, uh, I'm retired. I'm just isolating in my home in the Blue Mountains. I have nothing to do. I'm an ex-researcher in agricultural science. Have a statistics background as well. Do you need a personal assistant to help you manage all this stuff?" Wow. And I was like, I, I was completely floored by like her response and all the other positive responses we've received. Uh, I, I said no to her, of course, because uh, the university actually listened as well when we said we're drowning and we now have a new project manager, uh, her assistant, a new administrative assistant on the UQ side of things. So luckily we are getting the support that we need, but still, yeah, the, uh, the response is large. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, um, you are doing a fantastic job, like helping, you know, like this work can potentially help stop this or slow it down. So, you know, hats off to you. It's really cool. Really cool. Um, you know, the university might be listening to this one as well. Is there anything else you need? <laughs> let's let's do a wish list. A wish list. Uh, well, I wish I could get into America and start the job that I accepted many, many months ago. Uh, oh, yeah. I got offered a, a very nice um, a fellowship at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I was supposed to have had my visa interview and have everything planned to fly over there with the wife and uh, all cancelled indefinitely. So yeah. who knows? I'll be at UQ for the foreseeable future and uh, we'll see how, how long COVID takes to be consigned to the uh, pages of history. Wow. Man, you got married. When did you get married? I, I completely, sorry. I April that. 1st. Wow. Congrats. We decided... That is our anniversary, and we decided it's the best date to get married because half my friends on Facebook, especially because of COVID-19, the ceremony is limited to the celebrant, two witnesses, and me and my wife. Yeah. Five people. It's not like a big affair. So when I posted pictures saying, hey, by the way, a lot of people thought it was a very elaborate joke, which yeah. I encouraged for a solid week until I was like, yeah, yeah no, it's actually real. And right. that, was, that was the best, I think. I saved... So much money on the ceremony, so much money on the reception. The honeymoon was a bit lackluster. We uh, 
sat down, opened Google Maps, and just went through Street View in a few countries. <laughs> and we we're like, yeah, those look nice. Uh, we'll visit them one day. Oh, wow. Wow, man. Okay. Well, how long have you been together? Uh, a while. Um, like it, it's a very uh, short marriage. I think we met 2018 uh, at the end of it, maybe. I'm not quite sure. My memory is horrible. If you ask her, she'll know like the exact date and the exact <laughs> time and exactly what, you know. And me, I'm just like, yeah, it was a couple of years ago. It's fine. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's, Man, uh, congrats. That's really been cool. fun. Very cool. Thanks. Awesome. Um, okay. So, yeah, hopefully once this all sells down, you'll do your um, work there. So this is, you've got your PhD, right? So this is your postdoc. Yes. So I've got the PhD, but in amongst all the COVID-19 stuff, it still hasn't been awarded. It was like submitted, and sent off for review so long ago, but everyone has far better things to do. So I'm currently yeah. sitting here, not as a doctor, PhD -less. but as like <laughs> yeah, PhD list, working like two different postdoc jobs, pulling my hair out. Uh, making courses on the side, just waiting for my reviewers to eventually come back and say, yeah, it's all good. Gotcha, man. And they wow. will. They just need, to, they just need to get off your asses. Get me back my thesis. I put effort <laughs> into that. <laughs> gotcha. Um, okay, well, thank you for the rundown on COVID. Hopefully go, things go well there and uh, we all support you. And I'm sure our listeners, please show Sam some support, send him some nice emails if, if you are, you know, supporting him. And if there, if, even if you can't do anything to help, just it's good to, good to know you're listening. Um, speaking of courses, congratulations on launching your second course, man. Like uh, number two, first one was Python for Statistical Analysis about six or so months ago. And second one now is Python for Data Manipulation. <laughs> the irony is that's exactly what you're doing for COVID. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm lucky that uh, everything just fits in so well together. But yeah, I, I thought after seeing all the comments on the stats course uh, that the, the biggest skill that the people taking my course were lacking was the ability to use libraries like Pandas uh, to streamline all of the, the pre-processing stuff in their analyses because no one wants to spend 13 hours crunching numbers to do half an hour of you know machine learning or statistical analysis. So I was like, you know what? Okay, pandas it is. Uh, I'll make a crash course for that. Show everyone the easiest ways and the most efficient ways of doing all the common tasks. So I hope it's it's been useful for those that have signed up. Uh, I've got some some good reviews so far. Um, some people have reached out and said that they really liked it, uh, which is always pleasing to hear because you know you don't want to make it only to get people come back and say that was terrible. Yeah. So I'm happy. They're happy. I think we're all happy in isolation. <laughs> That's good, man. Uh, yeah, and speaking of reviews, you have some of the highest reviews we've seen across all the instructors we've worked with. You Both your courses have 4.6 stars out of 5 stable, which is really hard to maintain on a massive platform like Udemy. So like, what's your method? How do you do it? Maybe you know, there's people out there looking to create a course these days. Like, Maybe you can share some insights. How do you get such great feedback all the time? Honestly, I'm not too sure. I th I think one of the things is I keep in mind what I want as a student, which was, you know, a few years ago now, but I always remember listening to my lectures, you know, the online recordings and just wanting to unenroll. Like some of them would go <laughs> on and on about stuff I really didn't care about, uh, you know, pages upon pages of just talking at me before getting down to anything useful. So I decided if I ever made a course it wouldn't just be talk. I would talk about the code that I'm writing in front of you and try and keep it practical so there's something for you to do, whether it's uh, you know run the code in parallel with me or just read over what I'm writing or, or listening, but you know just not droning on. And I try and get to the, the, the good stuff quickly, but lectures always end up taking far longer than I thought. I remember I, I recorded a lecture just about histograms. And the, the first record, it took about three minutes. I'm like, you know, histograms are pretty simple. There's not much to talk about. And then uh, I got a ton of questions for people. And they were saying, hey, what about this use case? What about this here? Or my code isn't working here. And I realized even with such a simple concept, there are a whole bunch of little caveats or things that people don't quite understand intuitively. And so I went back and re-recorded and it became like a 15 minute video, but people seemed to like it. Those that already knew were able to watch it at double speed and sort of skip oh, yeah. to the parts that they needed. 
And those that had never seen it before managed to get all the relevant information such that they didn't try out the code, get an error, and then have to hit up Stack Overflow for half an hour afterwards, trying to figure out what on earth this keyword that they needed meant. Mm, mm. So that's, I'm not sure. I just try and keep that in mind, but uh, beats me. Yeah, man, that, that's a good approach to to over deliver because um, I, I actually met once at one of our live events. I met uh, a student and she told me like, oh, it's so weird to hear your voice in real life because I've been listening to you online all the time and you sound so different. I'm like, how, how do I sound so different? And she said, well, I listen to you on double speed. I've never right. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so a lot of people do that. And I, and I encourage people to do that. Right? Like I would rather put more into a lecture than less because you can just listen on double. But if there's less, then people who can't like who are not uh, as you know familiar with the topic, they will fall behind, and we don't want that. Yeah, and there's there's a personal side of it too, which I'm not sure is of too much interest for those listening. But if if you're making a course, so we released the stats course, the Python for statistical analysis course for free uh, for a little while during COVID until we had to we had to stop making it free, because in that one week we did free, I got 42,000 new students. That's more than has been in the course the entire time it's, it's been up. Yeah. So a huge amount. And the issue was, okay, well, I have two jobs at the moment, plus the newly released course. And now I have 42,000 students who ask questions. And mm. even, because they, you know, even though they got the course for free, I'm not going to ignore their questions. I'm going to go in there and answer them to the best of my ability, but it takes time. Mm-hmm. And so if you have these short lectures that you think are like, oh, this is really efficient, you know, 30 seconds and this topic's done and you haven't been comprehensive, well, people will just ask you about the things you haven't covered. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, instead of spending 10 minutes recording an additional one minute in your lecture, you're spending 10 hours responding to the same question 400 times. Yeah. And it's just not efficient. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Uh, tell me this. So, what you recorded in this recent course, Python for a uh, data, data manipulation of Python? Um, uh, you said pandas. Are you using pandas for the COVID analysis, or using some other tool? Yes, no, we're, we're ex- exclusively using pandas essentially for the data preprocessing step, uh, to the point where um, I can't think of a single function in amongst the pipeline that I threw together that doesn't make use of pandas in some way. Oh wow! So you know, every like date times are best handled in pandas. Pandas has categorical features, which is amazing. Uh, pandas, you know, everything is pandas, and that's that's not going to change. It's just such a convenient tool. That's so, so cool. It's a very a class, a very vivid example of practicing what you preach. I love that it happened in this order that you first recorded the course about pandas and data manipulation, and now you're actually using those same tools. Like it's a great testament to that. You know, these are applicable tools in, in industry, in medicine, in whatever, like emergency situations like this. You know these tools, you you go and use them right away. Really cool. Really cool. Um, what else did I want to... Oh, um, what I wanted to ask you about is... Um, I've had this question. So since our last chat, I've been I've been like killing myself over like breaking my head because I didn't ask you, and I was so like tempted afterwards. Like oh, I should have asked this question. Um, so we're talking about Bayesian inference, and we're comparing Bayesian inference to um, frequency statistics, right? Fisher and his thing. Uh, by the way, I don't know if uh, like listeners listening to this, I actually read that Fish, Fisher. So Bayes was the 19th century and fisher as far as i understand fisher was like 1920s like early 20th century and fisher didn't like bayes right he created his own uh, approach to statistics and so on which we all use now and which is taught at school the p values and things like that and fisher actually interestingly enough uh, he as well from what i read he you tried to prove that not smoking causes cancer but cancer causes smoking you know, speaking of the correlation and causation, like because it's a p-value, right? Like the the chart is there. You can run all the tests. You don't you don't know. You have to have some additional knowledge to know which way it works. But that's a like a, a side side story. So the question I wanted to ask you: You were talking about Bayesian inference, and you were talking about prior probabilities, uh, posterior probabilities. If I'm getting the names right, and you know how it, things are interpreted, and you gave this lovely example. By the way, I highly recommend to listeners to check out the previous podcast. I'll dig up the episode number and we'll mention the show notes. Um, fantastic episode. And you may give us a great example of like um, the sun exploding. You said, okay, so if we have this uh, 
device on Earth that is looking at the sun and predicts all of a sudden that the sun's going to explode in the next hour. Uh, well, we we can take all of the prior probabilities. We've seen that the sun hasn't exploded, like prior knowledge that we had. Sun hasn't had an exploded in billions of years. So most likely, if we account for that, then the probability actually goes down quite a lot. Right. So, do you mind like repeating or something like that, like that? Yeah. That so, example, so the example it. was: there's a box on Earth where if you push it, and like you push a red button on the top, it will tell you whether or not the sun is going to explode or not in the next like ten seconds. When you press the button, what it does is it tosses two dice, and if you get one on both the dice, it just tells you that the sun's going to explode. Otherwise, it returns the truth. And so the frequentist walks up presses the button, gets unlucky, it rolls two ones, and they know about the dice, but they say, you know, two ones, that's one in 36 chance. That's less than a p-value of 0.05. So we have a significant result that the sun is about to explode, and they run off to publish. Yeah. <laughs> and in the background, the Bayesian statistic is just sitting there, shaking his head, trying to bet that it won't. Yeah, yeah because he is using, or she is using the... Um... Bayesian inference, right? Which takes into... Yes. Can you tell us a bit about this prior probability? Right. So Bayes' theorem is that the, the your posterior, which is the, you know, the likelihood, the, the whole likelihood... The is end a combination, result. Yeah. So the, the end result is a combination of your likelihood. Yeah, you're right. I shouldn't say likelihood when I'm talking about the posterior. It's a combination of the likelihood and the prior. So the likelihood is what is the chance of getting the data given our model, and then the prior is what's just the flat chance with our current information of that model. Mm -hmm. And if you combine all of those, it's proportional to the probability of your model given the data, uh, which is different to the likelihood. So uh, if, if I speak the math very quickly, it's saying that the probability of theta given d is proportional to the probability of d given theta, so they're swell times by the probability of theta, theta being the model. And the idea is that uh, in frequentist statistics, we work with the likelihood, uh, and that's, that's fine. That's good. That's what you need to do. And then when you look at Bayes' factor, you also add in the prior, which is your prior past existing information. There is a, another part. Uh, the whole thing is a fraction, and on the bottom is what we call the evidence. But let's not get into that, because that's a, a much more conceptually difficult uh, thing to talk about without actually having diagrams or being able to write any math. So okay. posterior is proportional to the likelihood multiplied by the prior. Gotcha. And so what I was wondering since since then, like literally I think we hung up and this question popped to my mind or it was like towards the end of the podcast and running out of time. Anyway, so do you know the turkey paradox? No, no, you're going to have to tell me. It's simple, super simple, but it's like, uh, it's not even mathematical. It's, it's, not, it's got nothing to do with Tuki, the mathematician, uh, with the, what's it called, uh, t-test, I think. Um, it's just about a turkey, like an animal, right? So the turkey uh, is born, and it's it, it like it's a bit scared of everything at the start, uh, but then the farmer comes along, or, you know, whatever, the butcher comes along and feeds it some, some corn, and it's like, oh, wow, I got some corn from this butcher, that's amazing, okay, well... Maybe we can be friends, you know. No, that's you know. What's the likelihood of somebody giving me corn for free? All right. Then day passes, two days, three days, and it's like every day is getting corn. And then you know, like maybe a month passes, uh, six months, a year. I don't know how long turkeys are raised for. You know, like and every single day is getting this corn. So like the prior is like you know, or the uh, the that part of the probability. Yeah. So the yeah the prior right is is growing. It's like oh, all this evidence that he's my friend. He's my friend, and it's getting uh, like. If we apply Bayesian inference, the probability of the butcher butchering the turkey in the turkey's mind is going down all the time because all the evidence it's seeing is like like with the sun, like it's not it's not blown up, like the, I haven't been hurt by this butcher, you know. And I apologize to the vegans out there, but at some point the butcher comes and you know uh, slaughters a turkey for Thanksgiving or for some other thing. And, uh, you know, like, all, for, like this really messed with my head. Like, the, so you only have the sun example on, the other, on one hand, but with the turkey example, the whole Bayesian inference, like, goes down the drain because the result is inevitable. Like, it, it's going to happen. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. How do you apply Bayesian inference? Or what does that say about Bayesian inference? No, nothing. I mean, in this case, the Bayesian inference is perfectly fine. On any given day, 
The turkey is very likely not going to die until the day that the butcher decides he's had enough with that thing gobbling up all his bread. But that means that Bayesian inference has served the turkey correctly for every day but one, mm. which is a, a lot of being served correctly. And, you know, it's, it's only an issue in our heads because we know that the butcher is coming. We have access to hidden information. Our information is different to the turkey. So we see this and we go, oh, man, the probability of the turkey being butchered is so low from the turkey's point of view. And it's like, well, it is. But from our point of view, we know it's coming. But that's just yeah. because our priors are different. Yeah. So it serves the turkey well, and like as, as everything does, until it suddenly stops working. But mm. if the turkey lives for a few years, it served it very well for a very long time. Gotcha. So our priors are different. That's a, I think that's a key that we've seen millions and bi- I mean, hundreds of millions of turkeys prior to that. And we know that the end result, 99.999% is this. Yeah, precisely. So our conditional probability is conditioned on the knowledge that we know the butcher is going to butcher. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's so about it. Yeah, and that's that's a good um, feature of Bayesian inference. It's not a bug, but it's a feature. The more knowledge you have, the more accurate your prediction will be. And on, on that note, do any industries or businesses or I don't know, applications actually use Bayesian inference these days? Like I've heard of a few, but what, what's your uh, what's your knowledge in this space? Because it looks like everybody's using frequency statistics, uh, whereas Bayesian has a place as well. Uh, I think it's, it's difficult to, to say because it's easy to mix things up. So one of the giveaways of frequency statistics is when someone starts talking about p-values. We generally don't do that in Bayesian statistics. So if I use Bayesian statistics and I, I calculate some variable, I would say that, you know, X, you know, has been detected at, you know, 3.8 sigma confidence or, or similar. Like, mm. And whilst it, you would use a p-value in the frequency statistics, but that doesn't mean that someone using frequency statistics can't incorporate prior knowledge. They mm. just do it under a different formalism. So if someone says, hey, like, are we doing Bayesian techniques? I need to sit down and say, okay, well, how have you formulated your model? What prior information do you have and how is that being incorporated? It's very easy to try and sneak that information into the likelihood. And that's, that's fine to do in some contexts, but it does give you certain different mathematical properties of your outputs. Uh, so it, it's hard to say, uh, but a lot of the cases, uh, you know, you do use, uh, you know, Bayesian-like techniques. So using prior information almost everywhere you go, like every time that you've done something with deep learning, uh, you may not have run with a Bayesian neural network, which are, are things and they're wonderful and you should check them out. Uh, but the fact that you've trained on, you know, 10 million images means that you're incorporating prior information already. You just It's just not under the, the formalized Bayesian statistics headline. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a sort of blurred line that's difficult to actually draw in the sand. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Thanks. Thanks for the rundown. You should create a course on Bayesian inference. I would happily take it to... I have thought about about it, you know, modeling, how to fit models, whether you're doing different MCMC, so Markov chain Monte Carlo processes or similar, because everyone has a model and it's it's a lot easier to write a model than it is to correctly fit it to the data and draw the right inferences from it. Mm. And that's what I do a lot. So maybe one day when there's enough interest, I'll I'll write up and record a course on that. Uh, it, It all depends on what people want. So... Mm-hmm. Everyone Very get good. keen for model fitting and let me know. <laughs> Speaking of what people want, um, we have a very cool surprise announcement. Uh, Sam is joining us as a speaker on the advanced day at Data Science Go Virtual. Data Science Go Virtual is happening at the end of June or start of July. We're still deciding date, but but by the time this goes live, you can find out the date for sure. It's uh, available at datasciencego.com, so get your tickets there. Um, so Sam will be joining us as a speaker, and what will you be talking about? What wor- actually a workshop? What workshop is it going to be? Probably something on data science pipelines. You know, given that I've spent the past few months writing a few of these, and uh, years before that I've been doing them for in an astrophysics context, it seems seems smart to mm-hmm. finally formalize that and write up a workshop. And I've given workshops in the past on different topics, so it'll be good to add a, another uh, knock to the belt uh, and finally write up everything that I've been doing on this. But the idea is, is quite simple, I think, which is 
every data scientist doesn't want to be doing data cleaning. Uh, no mm -hmm. one particularly likes cleaning and standardizing data. So how can you write a pipeline in the easiest, most flexible and most extensible way possible to streamline all of that, to get you either your data products as quickly as possible, or to go through, generate not just the data products, but then do the machine learning and validation on them to get you not data products, but now machine learning products or business intelligence products at the end. So mm -hmm. the less time people spend uh, sort of screwing around, uh, playing with the data, the more time people can spend actually getting insights from the data. Absolutely. And the way this topic came about is we, we ran a survey and over 1,700 people interested in attending Data Science Go Virtual completed the survey. And among the advanced practitioners specifically, uh, the most popular topic was data science pipelines by far. Like it was like the, the next topics were still, you know, popular, but there was a huge, huge difference in the number one and number two topics. And so uh, why do you think data science pipelines is so in demand right now among specifically advanced practitioners? I think <laughs> exactly like what I said, no one wants to spend their time doing it. Uh, yeah. Data scientists spend most of their time not doing data science. Mm. And it's Cleaning an awful data, waste. Right? Yeah, and so it's an awful waste of time. It's not a fun job. It's not a rewarding job. You get a data product at the end, and now you can start your real job, which is getting insights and crunching the mm. models down to actually extract useful information mm. and being able to, to do something uh, like we've done with the, the COVID study, where every day we get a data refresh, and that happens automatically at 6 a.m. It's kicked off. I don't do anything. And then at the end of that pipeline, and it takes about five minutes to run, we have data products that have been uploaded to secure sites. We have reports available for people. We have an interactive dashboard. And we have, well, this isn't currently in because we don't have the data. We've sort of taken that out. But we will have machine learning products that have been refreshed each day because you don't want to go through and say, hey, we've got a new data set. We've got a few extra records. I'll just manually run these 30 models that I've thrown together and recompare them. It's like, no, you want to press a button, go off, have a little nap, come back and have your results there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe handle some exceptions at, at the most. That, that uh, there's, you can always, incorporate. there's always exceptions, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and... How do you teach data science pipelines? Like, how, what is a workshop? Give, give us like a teaser. What's a workshop on data science pipelines look like? Probably a lot of code. Uh, there's no way around it. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> one or two slides uh, to try and illustrate the topics. But uh, I guess the way that I have it in my head at the moment is it's essentially a collaborative coding. Everyone's coding their own thing, right? And I, I will have my pre-done version, and then people can deviate from that as they will. But just a probably something like Google Colab or you know Jupyter Labs in some instance, just to give everyone the basics. So how you can throw these things together, how you can chain all these methods in a robust way, and then how you can tie that into your machine learning product. So hmm. hopefully you start with, here's a bunch of raw data files, uh, and then at the end, you press a button and out come all your products that you want. And obviously, the way that this has to be done in the workshop may be different to how people do it in industry. So if you have a very large data set, if your data set is either you know, billions of records or thousands of features, you may not be able to run this on a laptop. You may mm -hmm. need to ship it out to high-performance computers, submit it to some sort of batching job on a cluster like Slurm Talk or SGE, a whole bunch of them. And that's very difficult to do in a workshop. No one wants to spend two hours setting up and trying to apply for accounts. So we'll have to cover a, a representative but basic example and then give people the skills or the pointers as to how they can scale that up. So whether they're using things like um, Dask to try and scale out to clusters or whether they just need to know this is how you submit jobs to a supercomputer. And obviously you can't do all of that in a single workshop. So we'll have to cover the basics as much as possible and then say for your use cases, this is where you want to go. For your mm. use cases, you're going to go look over at this. And so that's actually something that I think we're going to run a survey uh, with the people that responded to the first survey <laughs> saying, what are your use cases? Uh, what in your mind is a good 
data science pipeline? Like, what do you want out at the end? What are the products that you're talking about? What are the inputs that you're dealing with? Are we talking about megabytes, gigabytes, or terabytes of data? It's because the change, well, the pipeline changes depending mm. on all of these questions. And that's something that we really need from the people uh, going to the conference is what are their use cases? Because only with that knowledge can we create an effective workshop that actually benefits them at the end of the day. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, that's one reason why we ran the first workshop uh, to to ab- to know exactly what people want. And uh, sorry, why well, so we ran the first survey. Now we're going to run the second one. Uh, if you're listening to this and for some reason you weren't part of the second survey, maybe like we missed your response in terms of like identifying you as a key participant for the second survey or these more in-depth uh, interviews uh, that we're conducting, please send either our team or Sam directly, preferably <laughs> Sam directly, an email. <laughs> no, 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 preferably the team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can send us uh, an email. Um, well, well, we'll include it in the show notes for this episode, so you can find it there. Um, basically, send us an email and explain exactly what you would like to see in this data science pipelines workshop. We can still, when this goes live, we will still have time to incorporate your feedback. So yeah, that'll be cool. I'm looking forward to it. It'll be like a, a virtual, so it'll be people from all over the world. And yeah, and you know, like you have so much experience with this now, especially with this COVID stuff. Yeah, it'll be yeah good. sounds like fun. No yeah. pressure though, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hope you find find time to to not not go crazy with all this stuff around. Fingers um, crossed. Another thing I had in mind, watch your talk on cosmology with my girlfriend. Uh, what's what's your website again? What's that wonderful website? Oh, cosmiccoding.com.au. Cos- yeah. So everybody, cosmiccoding.com.au. Don't forget the .au. We're very special in Australia. Um, and yeah, it, amazing. Love the talk. It's called, if anybody's looking, it's called The Dark Side of the Universe by Sam Hinton in the Briz Science Lecture. And watched uh, about three quarters of it so far, or maybe two thirds amazing loved it like i never knew i knew about dark matter i didn't know there was even more dark energy in the universe that's crazy man like yeah i wish i knew what they were hey (laughs) yeah how do you do that but uh like some cool things i like that you provide that you know evidence of um what like how the charts uh fall in place and like that that this is not just like uh, you know voodoo stuff it's actual yeah it's, it's it's probably the most common question i get is like well what if dark energy and dark matter is just a mistake like what if you just you know einstein was wrong and it's like well okay he could be wrong but there are dozens of independent different avenues of investigating that all come to the same conclusion so if it's a mistake someone needs to come in and say how because we have very very substantial evidence that it's a real thing. We just don't know exactly how it's supposed to function or where it came from. Yeah. One day we'll have the answer. One day, maybe a million years from now. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) Um, Is that what your job in America is going to be about? Like, what's this postdoc? Yeah, so the postdoc is to investigate dark energy and dark matter primarily using two different probes of the universe. So the first being type 1a supernova, and the second being the large-scale structure of the universe. To give a a very, very tortured and brief intro to both of them, uh, type 1a supernova are a sort of exploding star that explode around the same brightness every time. Now what you can do is you can use them to map out the history of the universe, because remember, light takes time to travel. So a galaxy that has a supernova that we see that's a billion light years away, well, that supernova exploded a billion years ago. Mm -hmm. And because they're all the same brightness, it means we can figure out how far away that galaxy is by how dim the supernova is. Mm -hmm. But if you have a light and you start walking away, if you walk twice as far away, well, the dimness of the the light is now a quarter because Mm -hmm. the light is spreading out to cover the area of a sphere and sphere 4 pi r squared. Mm -hmm. So the idea is with this standard candle, we can map out the evolution of the universe. The evolution of the universe changes depending on the properties of dark energy and dark matter. Mm. The better we can constrain the evolution, the better we can determine the properties of those mysterious components. And then hopefully a theorician will come along and say, I propose dark energy is this with these properties. And we say, well, that works or that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, the, the leading one is Einstein who just said, well, dark energy is probably just if space itself, empty space, had energy. 
Mm-hmm. Turns out that fits with everything. We just don't know why it should have energy. You take quantum mechanics and you calculate how much energy the empty vacuum should have. It's not zero, right? Quantum mechanics says there should be energy, but it says there should be so much more energy, a hundred magnitudes more energy than we observe, which mm-hmm. is catastrophically wrong. Mm-hmm. Now, the second thing, the second probe is large scale structure. Let's see, what's the easy way to explain that? Uh, the universe is big now, right? And in space, no one can hear you scream. That's true. <laughs> but remember, the universe is expanding. So if we go back in time, the universe gets smaller and smaller, but the amount of stuff doesn't decrease. The amount of stuff stays the same, but it's now in a much smaller volume. So space goes from being empty to being filled with stuff like Earth's atmosphere, right? It goes to be thick and dense, and it becomes a fluid because there's as enough stuff As we go backwards. Now. Yeah. So as you go back to, if you go all the way back to right after the Big Bang, space looks like a fluid. It's got so much stuff in it and space is smaller, it acts like a fluid. And what that means is, well, quantum mechanics says that right after the Big Bang, some parts of the universe have just a little bit more energy than other parts. Hmm. Energy, mass, light, they're all the same thing at this point in time. So it has a bit more stuff. Now imagine you blow up a, a balloon in the atmosphere. That balloon, the area inside the balloon, has more air than outside. Mm-hmm. So you pop it, you get rid of that you know, elastic shell, and what happens? You hear the, the pop. The air spreads out. It's a little shock wave. Mm-hmm. It's technically not a shock wave because it's, you know, it's just air pressure moving. It's a sound wave. It's an acoustic wave. And so you have these in the early universe. You have these acoustic waves from these overdense regions spreading out. So imagine it's like uh, you've got a, a still lake and it starts to rain. You can see all the ripples from the raindrops spreading out. And that's what the early universe looks like. But space, and I'm taking a little bit of time here, but space, uh, you know, it was a fluid back then, and it's not a fluid now, which means at some point it went from a fluid to not a fluid. And this actually happens incredibly quickly in astronomical terms. Like, we're not talking billions of years or millions of years, we're talking thousands of years. So mm-hmm. Very quickly. So imagine you've got this lake that's being rained on with all the ripples spreading out, and then suddenly... Instantly, the lake snap freezes for some reason. Mm -hmm. You've got all the ripples will now be imprinted in the ice because it's frozen straight away. And that's what we see in the universe, except we can't hear it. We can't hear the ripples. But if we take a telescope and we measure 100 million galaxies, we can reconstruct the ripples because the ripples are patches of overdensity. Overdensity means more mass, more mass, more gravity, more stars, more galaxies, the more stuff. Mm-hmm. So if we simply figure out where there's more stuff in the universe than other places, that's a ripple. So we go out, we find all these ripples, and we use them in a very standard way that we use the supernova. Instead of it being a standard candle, it's a standard ruler. That We know how big the ripples are. We know that they had 300,000 years to expand. We know at what speed they expanded, because it's tied to the speed of light. So if we find a ripple that's X big in some area of the universe... We know that it started off as Y big, so it's thereby increased in size X over Y. So we can figure out how much any patch of the the universe has expanded. And again, we use that to map the expansion history, and we try and infer the properties of dark energy and dark matter. Uh, That was about a five-minute explanation. (laughs) I'm just going to, I'm going to call it there. (laughs) If anyone wants any more detail, there's a whole bunch of videos on dark energy and large-scale structure. That thing is called the Baryon Acoustic Oscillation, if you're curious. Wonderful, wonderful. So as, as a, what, what do you predict some side effects of your research? Will we have like new MRIs or anything like that? It's so hard to tell. Uh, the main benefit of current astro research uh, in breakthroughs that we have in deep learning and machine learning. So we obviously have images of the night sky. Mm -hmm. And we've tried to identify things in those images. And that's obviously very closely related to things like uh, identifying tumors or medical abnormalities in, uh, you know, MRI images or similar. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, it's looking less like a tech breakthrough. Like, you know, astrophysics gave the world digital cameras uh, a couple of decades ago. And I think we're still coasting that and we'll coast that (laughs) for as long as we can. And for now, it's just about sharing techniques. Okay, gotcha. All right. Well, man, looking forward to that. Sounds very exciting. Hopefully, you know, this job goes ahead very soon. It's going to be fun. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. Um, one last thing I wanted to chat to you about before we finish up is what books are you reading? Like, uh, you, you know, a person of your mind, of your, uh, like, breadth of applications and knowledge and 
in data science and other fields, uh, surely there's some interesting things you're looking into where you get all this information from. Yeah, it's uh, there are a few. There's a, a few books that I was recommended recently on causal modeling that uh, I have on my uh, to read list. However, in the past few months, I will admit that I have not touched a single textbook, okay. and that's that's not that abnormal for me. But with with so much work, with having both of these jobs and working nonstop, when I get a bit of downtime, I pick up my my novels. I just need a break from all of this data science, all of these data pipelines. I just need to turn off. And I'm a huge reader of fantasy, mm -hmm. uh, so Brandon Sanderson, all of his books and, and similar uh, authors. I've read around, I think, 45 books this year. 45 books uh, this year. It's, it is... April. <laughs> yeah, it's ten if, per month. I, I normally average uh, like one every every day or two. If I have a weekend off, I, I can read an entire book in a day. But I generally feel bad at the end of it. I feel like, oh wow, you really should have done something else. <laughs> like, you could have been at least a bit productive. Yeah, but, wow. Uh, I okay. try not be. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wow, crazy man. It takes me a month to read a book sometimes. Uh, what's the what's the most memorable book, even if it's fiction, that you read this year? Oh, geez. Um, oh, I don't even know the name of them. That's the <laughs> issue. I don't keep track. I'm just like, that's a good book. I I'll download it, read it, go on to the next. I don't remember the authors. I don't remember the names. Uh, let's see. What was... Hang on. Give me one second. I yeah. have the online repository in front of me. Let me just open books. Um, ah, yes. Okay. I've read... Uh, I think one of the ones that I liked the most by Andrew Rowe was Sufficiently Advanced Magic, which is just a, a, a lighthearted um, fantasy progression style thing. That was nice. And then there was the Cradle series by Will Wright. Mm -hmm. Eight, what, seven books or so. I read those in about three days. Um, How do you do that? Books. Like do, small do, books. Do you, do you <laughs> small books? Do you like? Um, uh, do you do like some speed reading or something like that? I used to. I try not to anymore. Uh, so I, I remember I, I did speed reading years ago and I got up to like several thousand words a minute. And I just realized that there's no fun. If you read a book in an hour, A, my retention is horrible. Mm. But, you know, I read to relax. What am I supposed to do if I read everything I have on my Kindle or my phone in, in, the, in a single day? Yeah. So no, I, I, I probably still read exceptionally quickly, but I no longer try and speed read. Okay. Uh, it's okay. probably still like abnormally fast but uh i just it have is. to live with that it is well <laughs> very impressive that's uh 45 books in this year i'm <laughs> put to shame i've read like three two or three so yeah okay all right cool well thanks for the recommendation andrew Rowe uh and will write some good fantasy books if anybody's looking for any um yeah i think we covered off everything is there anything you wanted to uh touch on before we wrap up uh, not particularly. I'm just hoping that I get a weekend off in the next couple of months and can uh, sit down and just chill out and perhaps go and actually read a textbook for once. So mm. that would be nice, a change of pace when things slow down enough that I can just breathe and, and learn. Because mm. learning is, I think, one of the things that I like most, uh, but it's so hard to, to find the time. So if anyone out there is currently stuck in ISO, and is uh, you know dedicating themselves to going through courses and upskilling themselves. I think that's an absolutely fantastic use of time, and I wish everyone doing that the absolute best of luck. I know that there's a bunch of people that have lost their jobs uh, recently, and at least trying to you know make a positive use of the time that we all have to spend at home is as much as we can ask. Fantastic, thanks, Sam, and a uh, huge thank you on behalf of all our listeners for you know doing what you're doing. You're you know helping the world and even though you don't have any free time and it's it's hectic somebody's got to do the job and you you fit you fit the right <laughs> you you're the best fit for this from the people i know for sure so thanks so much for what you're doing awesome my pleasure before we wrap up where can our listeners find you what's the best places to contact you follow your work uh, get in touch uh, let's see. I mean, LinkedIn is an easy one. You can send me a message there. I don't check it often, but I do check it eventually. Uh, that's probably the best way because I, most, most emails or whatnot that I get, uh, in the data science route are, are just as easily done on LinkedIn. No one really wants Instagram. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I try not to do work on that. 
Um, but apart from that, uh, yeah, hit me up on, on LinkedIn probably. Uh, if there are any urgent queries, uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, just know that I am incredibly swamped with emails at the moment, so I don't know if I'll have time to respond in the next you know, couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And Sam's website, if anybody is interested in watching his lecture, is cosmiccoding.com.au. Very, very cool. Thanks again, Sam. Re great pleasure chatting on the show. It was that awesome as always. Thanks for having me, mate. So there we have it. Thank you so much, everybody, for spending your time, investing your time into uh, this episode and learning alongside with us. I hope you got a lot of valuable takeaways. And um, yeah, so much cool stuff, so many cool things. And my, without a doubt, my favorite part of this episode was uh, all the things that Sam is describing about uh, the COVID uh, Critical Care Consortium, where he is the lead data analyst and all the takeaways he's getting and also the insights into what it's like to work with real world data, how messy it is, what challenges come up. I think it's always a great refresher. Uh, some some projects, uh, especially if they're um, course projects or um, you know projects prepared for you by somebody else can be too clean, too, uh, like too void, like they might not have any messiness in the data. And, I, anybody can be led to believe that uh, data science is like, well, it's not. It's actually very, very complex. There's a lot of uh, missing data. There's a lot of normalization that needs to happen. A lot of uh, pre-work of the data, building the data pipeline. All of that is super valuable. And speaking of data pipelines, make sure to check out Sam's workshop at Data Science Go Virtual. Data Science Go Virtual is happening at the end of June this year, 2020. And you can get your ticket absolutely free if you go to datasensego.com slash virtual. Just be careful, number of seats is limited. This is our first time doing an online virtual event. We've done this event many times in real life in California for many years. This is our first virtual event. The number of seats is limited. Make sure if you want to get in, apply for your seat today at datasensego.com slash virtual. And you'll see Sam running a workshop on data science pipelines. So you'll actually be able to code along with him and create your very own data science pipeline. So make sure not to miss that. And as usual, you can get the show notes for this episode at superdatascience.com slash 367. That's superdatascience.com slash 367. There you'll find the transcript for this episode, any materials we mentioned, including books and the URLs to Sam's LinkedIn website, his presentations online, and any other fun things that might help your learning growth in data science. So there we go. Make sure to check that out as well. And on that note, thanks so much for being here. Sam and I are looking forward to seeing you at Data Science Go Virtual in a couple of weeks. Apply for your ticket today if you haven't yet. And until next time, happy analyzing. <laughs>